Hi everyone, I'm Nick Olivo, and today we're going to make some macros in Roll20. Alright, so for the fighter type characters out there, we've got a great weapon fighting macro that automatically re-rolls 1s and 2s on your damage. For the Circle of Spores Druids out there, we've got a Halo of Spores macro that automatically scales in damage as your character increases in level. And for the Warlocks, we've got an Eldritch Blast macro that comes complete with a Death Ray effect. And the nice thing about these macros is they can all be done in any type of account. You don't need to have a paid subscription or access to the API in order to do these. Before we dive in, I'd just like to thank Roll20 for sponsoring this video. So let's start out with Great Weapon Fighting. And as you can see in the description here, when you roll a 1 or a 2 on a damage die for an attack you make with a melee weapon that you wield in two hands, you can re-roll the die and you have to use the new roll. So, how do we do this? Well, let's come back into the game here. And to roll damage, right, for a greatsword, for example, that's going to be 2d6. So, 2d6, we just slash R... 2d6. Okay, so that's that's the easy part. We get our, our normal dice there. If we want to make it this nice inline roll formatting, then what we need to do is two square brackets, and then 2d6, and closing brackets. And there we go. Now we get the roll that's nice and tight in line. But how do we make it re-roll if we get ones and twos? Well, for that, again, two square brackets, 2d6, but now we're going to put in R O less than two and what this is telling roll 20 is roll 2d6 and then if you get a two or lower in this example less than two actually literally translates to less than or equal to two so if we roll 2d6 and we get any results less than or equal to two we're going to re-roll those once that's what ro means re-roll once so if it's less than or equal to two re-roll the dice once there we go we get a nine if I do this again, you see here, it rolled again. We rolled a 1 and a 3, so we re-rolled that one to get a 5, which gives us our grand total of 8. So that roll, that syntax right there, is what we're going to use in order to re-roll the dice for the great weapon fighting. So this is where we're starting from, this 2d6 RO less than 2. We need to add to this. We need to add our strength modifier to the damage that we're dealing. So what we're going to do here is inside the brackets, we're gonna say plus, and then we need to add our character strength modifier. So that's at strength underscore mod. And that means we're going to take the strength modifier from our character sheet and use whatever number is in here. So if Grolf has a strength modifier of three, we're gonna roll 2d6, re-rolling ones and twos, and then add three to that result. And because I want to have that strength value called out, I'm also going to put str in square brackets like this. And now when we roll the damage, it's going to break it out with that exploded die roll showing us each die that's been rolled, and then we'll add the strength modifier with the str in brackets as kind of an annotation letting us know where this other modifier is coming from so that gets us our damage but now jumping back into the game we've got this other stuff that we want to do we want to have this nice formatting we want our attack roll and we want to put in our crit if applicable so how do we do that jump back into my notepad window here and an attack roll is going to be similar to what we did before it's going to actually look like this where we take 1d20 plus PB, that's our proficiency bonus from our character sheet, plus our strength modifier. And that's going to give us the attack roll. Now, I know some of you are probably looking at this going, well, how did you know that this is your proficiency bonus? How do you know that this is actually called strength mod? Where do these other things come from, Nick? So let me show you. If we go into the game and I open up Grolf's character sheet, right? I'm just going to alt double click on that. If you find any element in your character sheet, just hover over it. And you'll notice as I hover over the proficiency bonus, I get at PB. So that's my proficiency bonus. If I hover over my hit points, that's at HP. My initiative is at initiative underscore bonus. So you can just hover over these items on the character sheet in order to figure out how to refer to them in macros. Come over here and you go strength. There it is, at strength modifier. And if you hover over the little number, that's at strength. So you can get pretty much any piece of data that you need by hovering over the item here in the character sheet. So that's how we're gonna do our attack roll, all right? 
That's cool. So now that we've got our attack roll and our damage roll, what we want to do is put all that together into that nice purple box that you saw me use at the beginning of the video. And that purple box is what's called a roll template. And roll templates are used to format your die rolls in a specific way. And each character sheet that Roll20 supports has its own set of roll templates. So the 5e OGL sheet has different ones from the 5e shaped sheet, has different ones from the Pathfinder sheet, and, and so on. But all of these sheets have what's called the default template. And the default template is that purple box. So I'm going to paste in the code for this. And essentially what we're saying here is... And template default, that means we are using the default template. And then each set of double curly braces that you see right here represents a different row in the template's output. So this first one here where it says name, that's putting the heading Great Weapon Fighting into the template's output. And then this next set of double brackets, this is our attack roll. And so we're saying attack, that's the column on the left. And then equals, and everything on the other side of the equals is going to be displayed in the right-hand column. And you'll notice here I've got our attack roll spelled out with our strength modifier and our proficiency bonus. And because I want to have two die rolls in case we're doing advantage or disadvantage, I've got a pipe here. And then I've duplicated the roll after that. So there's two rolls being made with our strength and proficiency bonus being added to it. That's showing up as the attack. And then this next set of double curly braces is our damage, right? So again, standard damage, that's what's going to appear in the left column, the equal sign, and then here's the damage that'll show up on the right-hand side. And then the last set of double curly braces is the crit damage, in case we've rolled a nat 20. Now, you may be looking at that and wondering, well, Nick, can we build some logic into this macro so that it only rolls the crit damage if we actually got a crit? And the answer is no. Uh, we really can't do that using just a macro. In order to build conditional logic like that, we need the API. So if you're interested in seeing what a power card or a script card or something like that would look like with this sort of thing, leave a note down in the comments and I'll see what I can come up with. But in the meantime, now that we've got this template created, what we can do is just copy this whole thing. We'll jump back into our game. I'll go to my fighter's character sheet, which is right here. I'll go to the attributes and abilities section. We'll say add, paste that in. We'll call this great weapon fighting, save it, make it a token action. Now we'll click onto our fighter again. There's great weapon fighting. And there we go. We've got our attack rolls. We've got our standard damage and we've got our crit damage if applicable. So that's how we can make our great weapon fighting macro. So now let's move on to our halo of spores macro. And if you're not familiar with the Halo of Spores, this is something for druids from the Circle of Spores. And basically what it lets you do is use your reaction to deal 1d4 necrotic to a creature. And that necrotic damage increases to a d6 at 6th level, a d8 at 10th level, and so on. And really, I was just going to create a real simple macro that just rolled a d4 and then update it later on down the road. But I came across this macro on the Roll20 forums that Leon H. posted. And I'd never seen a die roll that looked like this before. And so I wanted to, to take it and break it down and show you folks how it worked because it's actually quite clever. So there's a lot going on in this roll, so we're going to take it piece by piece. So if I jump back into my notepad window here, you'll see that we're rolling a D, but then we've got like another inline roll inside the inline roll. And there's some math going on here. We're doing four plus two times something. So let's break this down and, and see exactly how this is working. So I'm going to come down to line seven here. And what we're doing to start with is we have our character's level. That's the right-hand part of the equation here. That's the easy part. So we might be level 10, we might be level 15. It's whatever our character happens to be. And we're looking to see how many of these numbers are less than our current level. So roll 20 is going to tell us that there's maybe one number less than our level, maybe there's two numbers less than our level, or there's three numbers less than our current level. So to help visualize this, Roll20 has this dice rolling page available, and this allows you to count how many successes there are between two values. So I'm going to say roll 3d6, there we go, and tell me how many of them are less than or equal to 3. 
Uh, just so you know, in dice rolling syntax, a greater than or a less than symbol counts as greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. So here we rolled a four and two threes. That means there are three successes here. If I copy and paste the code right from the macro, and let's say that our current level is 15, then you see that there are three successes here because 15 is greater than six, it's greater than 10, and it's greater than 14. So we have three successes. What that then means is if we come up here to line five, we're multiplying two times however many of these numbers are less than or equal to our level. So if we are currently level five, there are no successes here, then we're multiplying two times zero. If we are level six, then we're gonna be multiplying two times one. If we are level 10, then we're going to be multiplying two times two and so on and so forth. And that comes into play up here on line three, because what we're doing is adding four plus two times that value. So four plus the number of successes that we have. So let's say that we're level six. That'll be four plus two times one. So let's say that it's a six. You come up here and basically what that means is we're rolling 1d6. That's the output of this. If we were level 10, then that would mean there were two successes here. Two times two is four. Four plus four is eight. It means we'd be rolling a D8. So the damage is automatically scaling based on our level thanks to this syntax. And that's really quite clever because now you've got one line that's just going to automatically scale as your character grows in power. And we don't need to worry about manually going back and modifying this macro later on down the road. So now let's put this role into a template, just like we did with the great weapon fighting. So here it is. Just like before, we've got our and template default. So we're using the purple box template again. And then it's the exact same syntax. Each set of double curly braces represents a new row in the table. And our name on this one is gonna be Halo of Spores, just like you see down here. We've got necrotic damage. That's on the left of the equal sign. So that's gonna show up in the left-hand column, like you see down there. And then we've got our mathematical formula calculating the damage die that we're gonna use for the halo of spores based on our level. And then I've also got the saving throw listed out here. And as you can see, we are pulling the saving throw right from our character sheet right here using the at spell underscore save DC notation. And I've got a note saying that the con save negates. So now if we take this, jump back into our game, I'll open up my druid's character sheet here, give her a new ability. Paste that in, save it, make it a token action, and there we go. Now we've got our necrotic damage, halo of spores. And if I jump up her level, right, let's say that she's level 10 now, we see that we're rolling a D8. So that's how you can create the halo of spores macro. So the last macro we're gonna build today is Eldritch Blast. And so what I want this to do is, is just like before, we're gonna have our attack roll and our damage. But then we're also going to have it factor in things like my charisma modifier for the damage because my warlock has agonizing blast and my warlock also has the genie patron which means that they have this genie's wrath ability that allows them to add their proficiency bonus to the damage as well now I can already hear somebody out there saying well you don't need a macro for that you can just edit the character sheet and you're absolutely right. You could come in here, find your Eldritch Blast, click on this little gear, and then I could add in my Charisma modifier right here, and that's gonna do my damage, 1d10 plus cha, and then I can put my proficiency bonus under damage two, so there's at PB, so that's gonna add that in. But you know what this can't do? This can't give me a death ray effect. You're a warlock, you've made a pact with some powerful extra planar being, I think that warrants a special effect, right? So we want something like this, and that can only be done through a macro. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, aren't special effects limited to paid accounts? And the answer to that is no. It's true that you need a paid account to get access to the special effects toolbar button here, but the actual commands that you can use in a macro are available to all accounts. And so we'll see what those look like right now. So here's the start of the macro. Again, we're using the default template. We're naming it Eldritch Blast. And this is using a lot of the same concepts that you've seen throughout the course of this video. In my attack roll, you'll notice we're doing 1d20 RO1, meaning we're gonna roll a d20 and re-roll once if we get a one, because my warlock is a halfling and I wanna build that in. 
And then we're adding in our proficiency bonus and our charisma modifier to the attack. And then for the damage, we're doing 1d10 plus charisma for agonizing blast. And then we're adding my proficiency bonus, which is thunder damage, thanks to the genie's wrath ability. So this is the basics of the output in the chat, but we want that special effect too. So what we're going to do is on a new line, we're going to type in FX. That means special effect. And then we want to put in the type of special effect that we're performing. Now, if you come out here to this page on the Roll20 wiki, you can see that the syntax for this looks like this. FX type dash color source ID target ID. So type is beam, bomb, breath, burn, bubbling, all, all this stuff here. It's basically what sort of effect are we casting here? And then color is what does it look like? Is it acid? Is it blood? Is it death? Is it fire? Stuff like that. So what I want here is a beam dash death. That's my desired effect. And now I need to specify a source and a target. So where does the beam start from and where does the beam end? Well, the starting point is going to be the selected character, my warlock. So that's going to be at selected pipe token ID. So the selected token is the starting point, and then it's going to travel to the target token ID. And that's going to bring up that crosshairs that allows me to pick who I'm sending the Eldritch Blast at. So if you're copying and pasting this macro from the YouTube description, sometimes YouTube is funky the way that text gets formatted when you copy and paste from it. So you may want to just put it into a plain text editor like Notepad or something like this in order to make sure you've got everything on the right lines. Um, but this is what it should look like where you've got your template on one line and then your FX effect on the second line. And now we select all this and we'll come back into our game here. Go to attributes and abilities. I'm going to add a new one, paste that in, save it, show it as a token action. There's our target. And there we go. Attack, damage, and we can see we've got all of the right stuff in the attack and the damage output. So that's just a nice way to spice up your macros with some special effects. So there you have it. That's how we can create some macros in Roll20. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a like and consider subscribing. And if you'd like to see more videos on macros, drop a note down in the comments. In the meantime, folks, thanks for watching and have a great day.